Hey, good afternoon, product people. It's great to be back here at uh, beautiful LAX. And uh, <laughs> you know, as PMs, we've all experienced something like this story. Uh, we have a great idea for a new product or some, a way to solve a problem for a customer, way to make our product better. And of course, in order to get it greenlit, we have to build a, a case on what impact it's going to have. Is it going to make us more revenue or improve retention, or, or what's it going to do for us? And so we build the thing and we ship it, and the next thing you know, someone's knocking on our cube going, well, did it work? And the uh, truth is, we don't really know. A lot of times that's a really hard question to answer, but uh, it's really the most important question to answer because we're measured on impact. That's how we get paid, and that's how we advance our career. So what I'm going to try to do today is give you some ideas on how you can measure the impact of the things you ship. But first, a little bit about me. You know, when I was a young man, I was just totally positive that I was going to be a big rock star. <laughs> but that didn't work out. So I transformed myself into the product person that you see before you today. You know, I was always attracted to tech because um, it empowered people to do things that, uh, that they're not normally able to do. And I think the first place I saw that was with the uh, desktop publishing revolution. Um, and as a musician, I saw that in the way that tech transformed the way that music was recorded uh, and, and performed. And so that led me, you know, my first job was uh, working on computer music products. And from there, that led me into working on uh, digital media products, empowering consumers to do cool things with their photos and videos at companies like Adobe and Avid. And as I said, I really loved solving problems for customers, but I realized that, um, well, there's only one me, and there's a lot of customers with a lot of problems. And so I wanted to scale up and solve more problems for more customers. And in order to do that, I became a product leader. Uh, and by working with teams of product managers, I was able to solve even more problems for, for even more customers. And so I led a team of product managers at Amazon working on the Kindle. And I work at all of these great, smart, intelligent, data-driven companies. One thing I learned was it's easy to collect data. We would collect tons of data from the way people used our products. But it's hard to use that data. It's kind of like a, a, a roach motel for data. The data comes in, but it's hard to get it out. Typically, if I wanted to answer a question, I would go to a, a business analyst, and I'd say, these are the things I need to know. Uh, and the business analyst would say, hey, that's great, Mike. Uh, I'll put you in my backlog, and why don't you come back in about three weeks, and I'll have the answer for you. <laughs> and I realized that was a problem that product managers everywhere have. And then I realized that uh, there was a company called Mixpanel that was actually solving that problem, make it easy for product teams everywhere to self-serve uh, answers to their questions, to get that data out and make use of it. And so I thought about it, and I realized that I didn't have to always work for companies whose name started with A. <laughs> I, I could go for an M, and I joined Mixpanel so that I could help even more product managers solve even more problems. So being a PM, we have to answer a lot of questions. All the time, people are asking us questions. And a lot of times, um, when we don't have data, well, I like to say we're product managers, we make stuff up. <laughs> but what I mean is, if you don't have good data, you've got to trust your gut, you've got to trust your intuition, you've got to have that to be a good product manager. But today we're a lot more data driven, and the questions that we answer can be broadly broken down into three categories. There's what happened, why did it happen, and my favorite, did it work? So let's look at these questions in more detail. Uh, now what happened is, means um, we want to track everything. You can't move what you don't measure. So you measure what matters. Uh, we call those metrics. And we measure things like um, how many people completed our sign-up flow, uh, how many people are using our app, and how often, and uh, how long do they stick around, how often do they come back for our app, and more. 
Now, once, we're, once we know what's happening, the next, thing is gonna, the next thing that will happen is someone's going to ask us, well, why is that happening? You know, why is our, our sign-ups down? Why is our, our, is our daily active users flat? Why is our seven-day retention up? Now, the way we get the answers to these questions is through segmentation. Somebody once said that segmentation is everything in marketing, and it's, it's even more true for, for data analysis. What we want to do is break down the data and try to find the factors that are driving, uh, that are driving the changes that we're seeing. Uh, so we can break things down by environmental things, like uh, where do they live, what type of device are they using, what type of uh, OS are they using. We can break them down by demographics, you know, how old are they, what gender. Uh, we can break things down by behavioral factors, uh, like how many songs did they play in the past week, um, and more. And even when we use machine learning to help us out, all the machine learning is doing for us in the background is doing a bunch of different types of segmentation to find the, the most interesting segments, the segments that are driving those changes. Because really, when we're asking what happened, the question behind the question is, what should we do? How can we move our metrics the way we want to move them? How, how, can, we make our, uh, how, how can we make our retention go up or our conversions uh, stay where they are? Uh, what features can we ship? What UX can we change? What marketing campaign can we do? How are we going to move our metrics the way we want to move them? And so we figure out what it is we're going to do. We build the thing. We ship it. And there you go, someone's going to ask us, did it work? I don't know. Because this is what I'm usually going to see. This is my trend uh, of my important metric. There's the line where I ship something and nothing really changed. <laughs> hmm. Could be a bad day for Mike. Now maybe it's not such a bad day for Mike, I think, because I see something looks like this and I'm pretty excited. But then I noticed that the product manager sitting to the left of me is excited, and the marketing person to the right of me is excited. And the reason why is because there's a whole bunch of stuff that happened on that same day. And so how do I know which one of those events is what's driving the trend? Well, you know, the tried and true sort of gold standard here would be to do an A-B test. And an A-B test, of course, we segment our users uh, and we give some users access to the new feature, and we don't give some users access to the new feature. Uh, they're called the control group. And the um, thing about doing an A-B test is, first of all, it'll take, it takes some time to set it up, some work to administer it, uh, and it takes some time to get back the results with statistical significance. But the other thing about A-B testing, the reason that some of us don't like them is because by definition, when you do an A-B test, you're not giving all that goodness of your new feature launch to all of your customers. Uh, you've got your customers that get the new feature and they're happy, and you've got your control group, and they don't get the new feature and they're not so happy. So, you know, that's a reason why Apple, for example, uh, famously tries to shy away from A-B testing. They really care about the customer experience, and they don't want to subject any of their customers to a substandard customer experience. So let's take A-B testing off the table and let's think about a little bit more how we can figure out if it worked. Maybe if we did some segmentation. What if we could segment our customers by those that use the new feature and those that didn't use the new feature? Okay, now at least we can sort of do a after the fact A-B test, but we're still not seeing much change here. And the reason for that is that most people uh, or not everybody uses the new feature uh, on day one. You know, some people use it today, some people use it a week from now. So we're not really seeing uh, a, a change in our metric because it's spread out over time. So what if we changed our time base instead of being a linear time base, what if we zero based on days since the customers used the new feature? And here we can see now that our metric has gone up a whole bunch for customers that use the new feature since they used it. That seems like success. So we're gonna get paid, we're gonna go party, et cetera. 
But I had to go through a whole bunch of work to get to this. Um, and it would be really great if there was an easy way, a tool that could do this analysis for me. But what do I know? <laughs> All right, but some of you out there are smarter than me, I know. So you're going to say, hey, Mike, what about confounding factors? What about, I don't know, self-selection? What if the people that use the new feature are your best customers, so they're likely to do the thing that's your goal event anyway? Hmm. Maybe we can segment our way out of this problem, too. What if we compared, uh, what if we segmented customers based on how likely they were to do our goal event, and then compared those groups? That's called propensity matching. Uh, if you're a fancy data scientist. And uh, with propensity matching, we can actually do true causal analysis. Uh, you, can, you, can take, you can segment out that last confounding factor and really truthfully answer the question, did it work? So let's recap here. Uh, did it work is a hard question to answer. Uh, but if we segment, based on who used the feature and who didn't use it. Uh, if we segment based on the days since the first use of the feature. And if we segment based on propensity to do the goal event, then we can actually say, yes, it did work. And that is how we, uh, how we answer the question, did it work? <laughs>